If it's Wednesday, Democrats want to talk about abortion. Republicans want to talk about inflation. But the former president won't stop talking about conspiracies, as this country's problem with political extremism only continues to grow. Plus, MAGA Republicans sweep the primary season finale in New Hampshire, delivering a final blow to establishment Republicans in the run-up to November. And later, an NFL legend, a volleyball stadium, and a multi-million dollar scandal involving money that was meant for poor families. New text messages reveal the key players behind this major Mississippi fraud case. Happy Wednesday and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd. So the primary season is over. Battle lines for November are drawn pretty brightly these days. And we have only eight weeks to go until election night. Democrats are obviously trying to fire up voters on one big issue, abortion. But the White House is dealing with some self-inflicted wounds today on the issues of inflation and the economy, both of which are issues Republicans would love to be focusing on. But the GOP is dealing with its own unforced error of its own here in Washington on abortion. And we're going to get to both of those issues in a moment. But we're going to begin with what is arguably overshadowing all of these political developments. And trust me, there's a part of us that would love to look at this inflation versus abortion and say, oh, look, it's sort of normal political battle lines are drawn. Except we're not in normal times. The rise of extremism in American politics is largely being driven by the former president and current leaders of the Republican Party who seem to be going along with the former president. But we got to remember, he's still the leader of this party. Last night's primaries in New Hampshire are just the latest example of the power of the former president over the GOP. You have candidates like Don Bolduc, uh, an election denier, winning the GOP nomination for the U.S. Senate. And he won it by simply hugging Trump and his crazy lies. 27 states may see an election denier take control of statewide positions that help oversee elections. This is according to a nonpartisan analysis of the races. The number jumps to 35 states if you factor in U.S. Senate candidates, who, of course, have some say in the certification of state electoral college votes. So 35 of the 50 states will feature a statewide election denier. Think about that. They are all echoing false claims by former President Trump, who keeps finding new ways to embrace various forms of political extremism. He shared a graphic on social media yesterday of himself donning a QAnon lapel pin with a QAnon slogan. Perhaps he didn't notice all of that. Perhaps he doesn't believe any of it. But if it's about him, we know he loves it. He called into a protest last night held in support of January 6th rioters outside of the D.C. jail. And he spoke to the group on speakerphone. We're with you. We're working with a lot of different people on this. And we can't let this happen. What they're doing here is a disgrace. It's a disgrace to our country. And it just cannot be allowed to happen. That protest came just hours after a Trump-appointed judge convicted three January 6th defendants in a bench trial. One of those defendants was Patrick McCoy, the third. He was recorded pinning D.C. police officer Daniel Hodges with a police shield. This video may look familiar with you. He's the police officer being crushed in this door that you're seeing behind me. Just keep that in mind. The former president called into a rally last night in support of folks like him. Joined now by Ben Collins, who covers disinformation, extremism, and the Internet for NBC News. Also with me is Ryan Ryland, covers the Justice Department for NBC News. Ben, I want to start with you. You know, I... I there was a part of me that wanted to talk about all the different times that, boy, Donald Trump's really done it now. All the times he's touched the electric fence. And, you know, you can go back to insulting John McCain. You know, those were the good old days that the RNC would put out a statement condemning Donald Trump for attacking John McCain. But he touches this electric fence so often, he probably is a conduit for electricity these days. What he did with QAnon in the last 48 hours, what kind of impact has it had? Yeah, Chuck, I'd argue that his supporters like the electric fence. They are in favor of it, and they just mm -hmm. want to use it on different people. That's really what's going on here. Um, so what, what exactly happened with QAnon is he, he posted, like he's been doing on Truth Social recently, he posted uh, not just a nod to QAnon, but a, a, a full-on, basically, endorsement of QAnon. It was a QAnon account uh, that posted him with a QAnon lapel pin on that said, the storm is coming, and where we go, one we go all. All of that is QAnon stuff. The storm is uh, the end date for QAnon. It's, the, it's their big apocalyptic end date where um, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, all the people in the deep state, they believe, are going to be rounded up 
and uh, publicly executed after a trial but, but or, ben, a, or a military tribunal for treason. Hey, Ben, so, I'm, I'm curious, yeah. though. They've moved, that date has changed quite a bit with these QAnon <laughs> folks, right? We've passed it a few times, yeah. correct? Oh, my God, yes. Yeah. The very first Q post. So Q is like this fake government insider, right? Very first Q post on 4chan back in the day, 2017, so that 48 hours later it was going to happen, that Hillary mm. Clinton was going to be rounded up then. So it's all based on lies. It's all premised on lies. The difference is now, though, Donald Trump is not overtly... Uh, has has not been this overt about his support for this conspiracy theory until just this week. And it's a dangerous time for him to do that because people are more riled up than ever. Uh, and Ben, I'm just, when, when he does, when you say more riled up than ever, what does that mean? I mean, we've seen the sense that we saw what happened in Cincinnati. We've seen there was arrest at a Dairy Queen. Look, there have been threats against the judge that issued the special master. Folks will be quick to point out if I don't bring that up as well. It does feel like a little tinderboxy out there, but sometimes I wonder if we overrate the internet on that stuff. Oh yeah, of course. It, it, it's hard to know exactly uh, where this is all headed. But this weekend, for example, there were two different uh, QAnon related crimes. One, a, a man tried to murder his whole family. He murdered his wife, he injured his daughter in a shooting, he killed his dog. And then his other daughter went to the internet to say that QAnon did this, that he, this man has always struggled with mental illness, but he has been obsessed with the idea that pedophiles are around the world and that QAnon is part of it. Um, so that was one murder just from mm -hmm. this weekend. And then there was that man at Dairy Queen mm -hmm. who uh, went to a Dairy Queen uh, with, with, a, with a clown ha uh, wig on and, uh, and said he wanted to kill all Democrats as well. That was thankfully diffused. But that's just in the last few days. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what you're going to see constantly are these like individual instances, especially when these groups lack organization. Uh, before January 6th, they had plenty of organization. They knew exactly where to go. There were buses to bring them right. in. Um, there was the top, the, the top of the food chain was Donald Trump telling them to go there. Right, right now, they have no one place to go. And this is the kind of thing you're going to see especially as the election gets closer and closer. Ryan Riley, let's talk about these uh, folks that were convicted, three more January 6th defendants. What made this significant? So this was a bench trial, and it was a Trump-appointed judge who was overseeing it. And, you know, two of the key, the, one of the key charges here is that obstruction of justice charge, which actually, for two of the defendants, um, he acquitted them on, which is going to have major impacts because that's actually the, uh, the charge that gives you the most criminal exposure. Although, overall, they were convicted of most of the charges. There was also um, a, uh, a plea agreement yesterday reached in, for an individual who dragged a, a Trump fan who's wearing a Trump uh, 2020 hat uh, when he dragged an officer down the stairs and then later told officers that they were, quote, going to die uh, tonight. So that's where sort of things stand in these cases. You know, you showed that video earlier uh, of, of Trump speaking to individuals outside the D.C. jail there. I just want to run through who some of those folks are. So one of those individuals is the mother of Ashley Babbitt, who was shot when she jumped through the window uh, going onto the floor of mm -hmm. the house. Um, Another individual uh, there is a member of the was a member of the Proud Boys. Another individual actually has been harassing officers during uh, testimony at the D.C. federal courthouse. Uh, he's the the larger man um, on on the left in that video. So it's really just a lot of a lot of folks who he's speaking directly to who have really you know extremist views. That was an individual who's been. Uh, barraging people in the elevator outside the courtroom, um, following them back to uh, back to the D.C., uh, the D.C. Uh, from the courthouse to the Metropolitan Police Department. So some real sort of fringe figures who are out there who he's uh, been speaking to here, Chuck. And Ryan, how many more, what do we have left in these trials? How many more trials are around? I mean, this was a bench trial. Uh, how many more uh, open cases are there with insurrectionists themselves. I understand the... For five years out from 2021, because that's really what we're looking at here in terms of the trajectory. Right now, there have been over 850 people who are charged. About over 350 people have, have either pleaded guilty or been found guilty um, at trial. Uh, but, so that's, you know, they've mm -hmm. got a chunk of the people who they've actually charged, convicted. But remember, there are hundreds of people yeah. out there who have already been identified to the FBI who have not yet been arrested. So a very long path ahead here, Chuck. Uh, and uh, very quick Quickly, the last probe that Bill Barr uh, allowed to happen under his watch, the, the so-called Durham probe of the investigation of the investigators when it comes to Russia, that grand jury expired. What does that tell us here, Ryan? 
It tells us that I think that's something that would have been put out of its misery a long time ago had it not been for how that would look politically. And, you know, Merrick Garland wants to make sure that there's no political interference in something. So he's let that play out. But I think that the sign of it wrapping up without much to show in their way of results is indicative of what uh, they were able to do there, Chuck. All right. And we'll consistently wait for the Durham report for the next 10 or 15 years on a various QAnon website near you. Uh, ben Collins and Ryan Riley. Thank you both uh, for getting us started here. Tomorrow, President Biden plans to host a summit at the White House on the topic of extremism. To, quote, counter the corrosive effects of hate-fueled violence on our democracy. And yes, threats to democracy is a message that Biden has been hitting harder and harder on the campaign trail in the past few weeks. But it comes, as we said at the top of the show, as the White House committed something of an own goal on a different issue after hosting a celebration of the Inflation Reduction Act yesterday on the same day that Wall Street had its worst day in more than two years, following a worse-than-expected inflation report. And while the GOP is seeing that as an opening to just hammer Biden uh, for his handling of the economy, looking out of touch, Republicans also suffered a, a self-inflicted wound of their own as Senator Lindsey Graham, seemingly out of nowhere, introduced a bill that bans abortions nationwide at 15 weeks, renewing attention on Republicans' most vulnerable issue ahead of November. So joining me now is NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli and from Capitol Hill, senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor. So, Mike, let's start with the White House and inflation. Uh, a lot of people are asking this question, Mike. Did they realize an inflation report was coming and they planned it for it because they thought it was going to be a good report? Or did they, did, that not, did they not think about that as they were planning this event? Well, Chuck, so many of the conversations I have with White House officials devolve into media criticism. This is yeah. a White House that rather quietly, maybe in contrast to their predecessors, but they share in their frustration with the way that they are covered. And this idea that they maybe had something, as you put it, of an own goal, misses really what the message was from the president yesterday. Yes, they would have preferred a better inflation number. And yes, they would have preferred not to see Wall Street tank in the way that it did yesterday. But part of what the president was trying to convey yesterday, and we heard it even more explicitly from Chuck Schumer, who also spoke as part of the program, is we know inflation is a problem, and here is what we are doing as part of an effort to deal with it. Right. And then you heard the president explicitly say Republicans are only trying to run on the issue without proposing any alternatives. And in fact, he singled out Kevin McCarthy for saying their number one priority in the next Congress would be to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. And then you add to that the other own goal that they welcomed. And I, right. I heard from a number of very senior uh, White House officials yesterday who couldn't believe their luck at Lindsey Graham yesterday. And you heard Senator Schumer say this as well. We are trying to focus on pocketbook yeah. issues while the other side is trying to take <laughs> away your rights. And so they actually felt on balance they'll call yeah. yesterday a win for them. No, I, I look, I understand why they think that. They, I'm sure Democratic candidates raised more money yesterday on, their, on, on, on what happened yesterday with Lindsey Graham than Republicans did on what happened with James Taylor at the White House. So don't get <laughs> me wrong, I get that. But Mike, this report was not good. This report indicates that there does need to be some action on inflation. Number one, it's our labor market. Number two, it's our labor market. Number three, it's our labor market. We need more workers, particularly in the lower wage scale, and the White House doesn't seem to want to deal with this. Well, and the one number that the president in a written statement yesterday highlighted was that there was continuing to be wage growth. But you have a good story in which is the still uh, overheated, potentially, job market creating one of the problems that they're facing, which is that higher wages are also leading to higher prices. And, Chuck, you know the issue they don't want to touch. Uh, talk about electric fences, which yeah. is immigration. immigration. Yeah. That is the answer here to deal with uh, some of these challenges. But that, uh, and I think you heard it as well in your interview with the vice president over the weekend, is something they're still keeping very much at arm's length. They, they don't want to have, they'll, they're happily take credit for everything they've done on gas prices. They don't want to talk about the employment issue at all. Mike Memoli at the White House Force. Mike, thank you. All right, Sahil, let's go to Lindsey Graham. There was some, he we were wondering if he was on his own yesterday, and today we find out he's not on his own. A Republican senator who's on the ballot in 2022 is signed on to Lindsey Graham's bill. It's Marco Rubio. But other than Marco Rubio, it, it, who else is signed on to this? 
Well, Josh Hawley, for one, Chuck, it's, it, Lindsey Graham is certainly not alone. There are There is going to be a contingent of Senate Republicans that agrees with him. Uh, nearly every Senate Republican just a few years ago voted for a 20-week abortion ban, and that's a bill that's been reoccurring that Lindsey Graham has been introducing just about every Congress. It always dies because of the filibuster, but it got a majority of the Senate last time. And at that point, Chuck, they were playing with blanks. Now they're firing with real bullets. Mm -hmm. And that is why you see Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell suddenly very reluctant about this. He told reporters yesterday that he prefers for it to be a state issue, even though that is a turnaround for him because he has voted for the 20-week abortion ban in the past. It just shows you the extent to which Republican leaders don't want to talk about abortion. They recognize that it's a galvanizing force for Democrats. A, a senior staffer for Kevin McCarthy, who you mentioned, just walked by where I'm standing right now and whispered in my ear, 8.3% inflation, 8.3% inflation. That is referring to the August number. That is all they want to talk about, McConnell and McCarthy. Uh, Lindsey Graham does not help their cause, but this is, this is a cause that he has embraced for quite some time, and a cause that Republican leaders have also embraced for quite some time. So it's kind of difficult for them to explain why, why not now. So here's what I'm curious about on the specifics here, Sahil. Take a Josh Hawley. Why is he signing on to a bill that would actually make abortion less restrictive in the state of Missouri? Well, it would make abortion more restrictive in uh, the majority of the country, Chuck. Right. I think that's the way to, that's the way he's thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It would not change the law in Missouri. States with more restrictive laws would be able to keep their more restrictive laws. This would simply set a baseline standard that abortion can never happen anywhere in the country after 15 weeks. Why is Josh Hawley doing this? He is playing to the conservative base. He's from a red state. He's someone who's rumored to have presidential ambitions. There will be a lot of them, uh, Republicans in the House and the Senate, who embrace yeah. that. And this is where the midterms are going to have a huge impact, Chuck. The numbers are going to tell the whole story. If somehow Democrats pull off a couple miracles and hold control of mm -hmm. Congress, expand their majorities, they're going to try to pass uh, legislation to codify it legally uh, everywhere. If Republicans take the majority in the House and the Senate, they're going to look at their numbers, see where the votes are, yeah. and consider how aggressive they can go. You know, Sahil, I'm just trying to figure out, did Lindsey Graham decide to do this on his own or was he goaded into this? And the reason I ask it this way is I've had a lot of Republican strategists and Republican consultants whisper in my ear, you know, the sweet spot for the pro-life side is 15 weeks. And lo and behold, here is as, as aggressive of a political animal as there is in the Senate, Lindsey Graham, out there trying to sell 15 weeks. It seemed like a hand-handed attempt to unite the GOP around one position and it backfired. But is, is that his motivation or was it something else? Well, I think it's pretty clear, Chuck, that he didn't do this with the acquiescence of his own party leadership. But one Republican aide I spoke to earlier today suggested that the Dobbs case changed the standard. It was the Mississippi law that uh, uh, outlawed abortion after 15 weeks that went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld that and also says, oh, by the way, Roe versus Wade and its, pres its subsequent precedents like Casey are gone. You can do whatever you want now, legislators, in terms of uh, regulating abortion. But that mm -hmm. 15 weeks, that sticks with people because that was the, that was the case that went to the Supreme Court. And it shows the, the, you know, the, the needle moving on the uh, anti-abortion rights uh, mm -hmm. side of the debate where Republicans are facing pressure. They know that this is their opportunity after half a century of fighting. The Supreme Court has opened the door. They're, they were never going to be satisfied with a 20-week ban. They were always going to want to go more aggressive. Well, the question is how aggressive. But ironically, if they, 15 weeks is really what they wanted, they should have just lobbied Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, and they might have had 15 weeks with Roe v. Wade. They, they might, and I suspect if they pass a 15-week ban, Chuck, they're going to want to go further than that. There's, there, and, it, it, won't, it won't stop here. And that's the, the problem the party has, is that they don't have, they don't have credibility to say they would stop where, they, where, where, where uh, this bill would do that. Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill for us. Sahil, what a story. Thank you. Coming up, the primary season finale. A self styled political outsider and Trump acolyte wins the Republican nomination in the race for New Hampshire Senate with a little help from some Democrats. What it means from November and the future of the GOP, all of that is next. Plus, we'll have the latest on the ground on the war in Ukraine and Russia, as Russia is reeling from its recent losses. Vladimir Putin is preparing for a high-stakes meeting one-on-one -on -one with China's President Xi Jinping. That's ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we mentioned, as of last night, the 2022 midterm primary calendar is closed. No more primaries, folks, at least until 2023. The last of the marquee Republican primaries turned out like most other Republican primaries this cycle, with the candidate closest aligned with former President Donald Trump coming out on top. As our friends at the Cook Political Report put it, it was a mega sweep in the Granite State. 
Retired Brigadier General Don Bolduc topped State Senator Chuck Morse for the Republican Senate nomination in New Hampshire. Bolduc has echoed the former president's false claims about the 2020 election. And actually, he's went a step further. He's open to abolishing the FBI. That's right. The Republican Senate nominee of New Hampshire would like to abolish the FBI in response to their search of Trump's Florida resident. He also called the state's current Republican governor, Chris Sununu, a, quote, Chinese communist sympathizer. Don Bolduc, ladies and gentlemen. Sununu was the establishment's dream candidate in this race. He did not run. He has said he will back Bull Duke in November because he won the primary. Trump loyalists also won down the ballot in the congressional races. Robert Burns topped Sununu back George Hansel in the state's second congressional district. And a 25-year-old former Trump staffer named Caroline Levitt won the Republican primary in the first congressional district. Like Bull Duke, Levitt also backs false claims about the 2020 election being stolen. Dasha Burns is on the ground in New Hampshire. And Dasha, the New Hampshire Republican Party has always been actually bright line split between a very chamber of commerce business wing a la the Sununus yeah. and a really sort of out there wing that has always been a little bit like they they live uh, in the in in the in the cold too often type of uh of wing of the party so trump type of messaging can work in new hampshire it can, but you got to remember, New Hampshire, very independent-minded voters here. 38% of voters in New Hampshire are unaffiliated, and that's why, Chuck, you know, Trump is very happy that all, all three candidates that won their primaries last night, he called them the Trumpiest candidates on his uh, social media platform. He's happy about it, but I got to tell you, Democrats are also pretty happy about it. Apologies, there's a freight train, very New Love Hampshire it. scene out here. There's I'm a freight train coming, right just here. don't be in front of it. Um, <laughs> that's right. Um, Trump happy with this outcome. Democrats also pretty happy. They were hoping for the more right-wing, more MAGA candidates to win. They think they'll be easier to beat come November, particularly in the Senate race. Chuck, so many of these themes we've seen throughout the primary season culminating here in New Hampshire. We've talked about it before. Democrats once again meddling in the GOP primary here, trying to boost Bullduck and sink his more uh, moderate establishment favorite uh, Chuck Morse. A, a dangerous game and a controversial strategy strategy here, but here we have it. Bolduck is the nominee. And Chris Sununu, you talked about the GOP governor who's more moderate, uh, was hoping for that establishment candidate. He is now sharing the ticket yes, with the is. guy that he said was too extreme, with the guy that called him uh, a communist, and not only with him, but also with the two other uh, more MAGA candidates. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how uh, those dynamics play out. And uh, Maggie Hassan already, the Democratic senator who, who's vulnerable in this race, she's already already capitalizing on uh, Lindsey Graham's news that could also right. make things a little bit more difficult for Republicans here uh, all today, holding a press briefing, putting out an ad focusing yeah. on uh, the abortion rights that are at stake in this race, Chuck. Well, I can't wait for the unity rally, uh, that Republican ticket between the Chinese communist <laughs> sympathizer Chris Sununu and Don Bolduc. Um, if that event takes place, you're going to have something covered there, Dasha. So we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced That's it right. takes place, but Dasha Birds, thank you. Joining me now, I got Mariana Sotomayor, congressional reporter for The Washington Post, Maria Teresa Kumar, the president and CEO of Voto Latino, as well as an NBC News political analyst and Republican strategist, Matt Gorman. You know, Mariana, I want to take people through sort of like how we come up with our process of, of what to focus on. And obviously, every day, you, right now, it's September, so it's the midterms, what's focusing. And you sit there and you, and you watch this sort of three screens, maybe four screen picture out there, right? You know, on stage left, it's Lindsey Graham did what? <laughs> stage right is James Taylor did what? Right? And everybody else is, what's the Queen's processional <laughs> today, right? <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what cut through and what didn't. Mm. What say you, Mariana? So on Capitol Hill, I mean, Democrats have been trying to make abortion a thing, especially what Lindsey Graham did yesterday, which he admitted he did not talk to McConnell, he didn't talk to his colleagues. Who he did talk to were these pro-life groups who even he admitted it took him a lot to get all those people to stand behind him and say, 15 weeks is okay. And you're starting to hear now that the House is back, a lot of those Republicans wanting something more extreme, six weeks or mm -hmm. even like total bans. Democrats, of course, giving a lot of oxygen to that, saying, right. you know, this is the extreme party. We're actually passing policies. But one of the things that's not being talked about that could become an issue that literally no party has talked about today during the press conferences 
is the potential rail strike right. that's about that's to hit. Right. train you just heard yeah. back. Yeah. I was like, that might be the train. last train. You might not be hearing that. You know, Matt, I saw Brendan Buck tweeted, uh, you know, over, like, a, a thing about Lin and Lindsey Graham. He goes, and who thought this was a good idea <laughs> of all days, you know, to have done that? I mean, it, it you know, you, the, the, the economy story should be a good story for Republicans to be able to communicate on. But I'm wondering if the voters are as fully tuned in as, as the party is. I mean, think about it. I mean, we maybe had an hour of, 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 like, the inflation news to talk about that before this dropped. I mean, think about if you're a Republican, you had just a great political issue to go on. You know, Biden is there with a quote-unquote celebration. You got sweet baby James playing. And we're, fo we're forced as a party to talk, talk about this because, you know, he brought it up. And, look, I think Mitch McConnell kind of, you know, said it all. It was to say it was tepid. I think yeah. is, is even generous. Uh, he didn't go as far as he did with say Rick Scott's plan, but he made it very clear, as you said, this was unsanctioned. Yeah, I mean, it's a gift, Maria. Well, I mean, if you heard Nancy Pelosi, according to the GOP, you know, conception starts at candlelight dinner, right? And that is the, and that is the quote that is sweeping everyone because she wants it to be focused on abortion. If you look at what happened in Kansas, it wasn't just that women went and voted against the measure, but it was actually Republican men who voted Republican but then switched their vote when it came to that, that referendum. According to a Fox News poll, dads are now tracking almost 28% to Democrats, and it's because, for whatever reason, Lindsey Graham did think it was a good idea to give something. By, to by the way, you've reminded me of a, of a subgroup that I want us to focus on, yeah. which is um, men with daughters. That's right. Yeah, men yeah. with daughters. Are we seeing any difference between men who have daughters and men who don't have daughters? But Matt, I want to bring up the fourth screen, if you will, and that is this sort of extremism mm -hmm. screen, which is with Trump. He's out there endorsing QAnon right now. And yet, at the end of the day, if Trump voters aren't excited to go to the polls, you guys have no shot. How do you manage this? Yeah, I, look, I think about the QAnon post, I think it was just nothing more, quite frankly, his intention behind it was simply he wanted to get attention. He wanted to oh, just capture it. Okay, yeah, but, no, we, no, I know, but that's I know. the explanation no. for Trump going oh, all of his crazy. Oh, no, no. I, I, it's I, always I, narcissism I, is always the oh, answer. Oh, oh, I, no, I, I, I get it. I think that was just, it was like, well, you know, they're not paying attention to me yet. Like, let me throw this out. Look, I, I think a couple things. You're, you're absolutely right. We need that base. Is it a question of are they going to go and just vote against Biden like they did with Obama? It's like it was more of an anti-vote. Or is there some sort of, you know, mm -hmm. I'm voting because of Trump or because of, you know, a guy like Bull Duke? Yeah. I, Mario, I, it does feel as if the one conclusion we can come from the primary season is that despite the establishment's best efforts, it's still Trump's party. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they know that they have to follow that line, whether it is a QAnon line. I think we've seen them. Right. Right. They don't, they're, right. not gonna, they're not going to support what he's doing, but they can't trash it. Yeah, and like, you've seen it in, in all of these races, too. You know, McCarthy has had his endorsements. Some of them have won or lost. Elise Stefanik, who is very close to Trump, I think is one of the members who talks to him the most, has endorsed members, won or lost. It's going to be interesting to see how that entire conference mm -hmm. actually you know, do they actually end up electing someone like McCarthy to be speaker? All of these things are in question because it's going to be just a completely different conference than we see now. Maria Teresa, how would you be talking about the economy right now? I know you want to be on the, on the offense. You're talking about abortion. You're talking about democracy. Yeah. I get that. That's the offensive issue. But you... There are persuadable voters out there concerned about the economy. How would you talk about it? How yeah, would you and I mean, I think one is actually the, the real substance of stuff that people can do right now as a result of the IRA, right? Mm -hmm. The Inflation Reductionary Act allows people to get up to a $1,000 in rebate by getting a heat pump and getting appliances. Guess what is pretty inexpensive right now? Appliances, because all of a sudden, everyone overordered during the pandemic. So there's money in the pocket. That's one. But I do think that when you talk to Democrats, and they don't have an answer for it, is that right now, the biggest indicator of how you're going to vote might be how the weather is in October. And what I mean by that is that mm. you're going to get your ballot and you're going to get your electricity and gas bill mm. and coal bill. And you're like, holy moly, this is three times what I paid last month. And mm -hmm. that is they're going to have to figure out how to message that. I, I've been wondering. I've, I've thought the one biggest unknown in the economy is we know Europe's about to cause, it's going to have a massive energy spike. When do we feel it? Before or exactly. after November 8th. And yeah. Before or after Friday. Again, this rail strike, I mean, the, it, transporting coal, like you could see energy prices, food prices surge. Like, it, it, this is coming very quickly. And you want to talk about a fifth screen that, again, Mariana pointed out, no one is talking about that either party. Yeah. Yep. That is going to uh, come up real quick.
Um, let me reverse question. You've got this mess uh, right now uh, on abortion issue, but you have something. I know what you want to run on is the economy. Mm -hmm. How do you advise candidates to message abortion? Uh, you know, I, I talked about this as, as much as, you know, I, I think is you don't run from it. You, uh, and what I mean by that is you can't ignore it. We saw what happens with some special elections if you try and ignore it. You have to rebut it and say essentially, look, what limits, if any, are you for? We saw Tim Ryan on CNN a couple weeks ago stutter and stammer about it. We've seen Nan Whaley on this program do it. I, again, I'm not saying you run on it, but you need to have a rebuttal to at least get them on defense a little bit with it. What... I know that they thought 15 weeks would do it, and pre-row it did. But, you know, they seem to be trapped in the ban. Republicans, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, they are. They're, they're at a point where no one wants to talk about it. And I, <laughs> I was talking to members privately, obviously they won't admit it, um, and, and aides saying, why do we have to put this front and forward? Because they also know that there's members within their party that want to do something more extreme, the six weeks, or a complete and total ban, which there's no real legislation that would get to that point, but mm -hmm. there is a six weeks. But even leadership aides, I mean, Scalise today backed away and said, you know what, we need to see what the majority is going to be like to even bring up the 15-week bill that Congress makes. So what does he say that? What does he mean by that? Does he mean he wants to see how many, how many, what, you know, if it's a five-seat majority, they'll, they'll go for one policy. If it's a 25-seat majority, they go for another? It's quite possible. I mean, yeah. McCarthy has even made this point. He wants a large majority, but also a governing majority. And what people say around him say is what mm -hmm. that means is, someone that's not going to be a complete and total thorn in his side on him being leader or just passing policies. They actively want to do that. He, needs, might not be he, able he to. wants to have 30 votes that he can yes. e let go, yep. either from his right or from his left. Correct. Yeah. What were you going to jump in? No, I was going to say, everybody wants that. No, I think <laughs> my, 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 my Pelosi right. probably wanted right. that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, no, no, I, I, yeah. no, I mean, I think one of the, the challenges that the Republicans are going to have is that they're making it uh, very much a cultural issue when the majority of Americans, independent, and a lot of Republicans don't want it either. And that's why they're trying to switch it away. I found it fascinating that, uh, that Cornyn came out from Texas and said, no, no, this is a states' rights issue. Remember that, guys. It's because he has his own political aspirations and mm -hmm. he's trying trying to figure out how to keep them but in line. Look, I, sh I don't want to, I, I felt like we talked about it a little bit, but can we play Lindsey Graham? Also used to believe yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Lindsey Graham flipped on this, is it the states or the federal government, in, in a matter of three weeks. Let's, uh, let's show the evidence. The point I'm trying to make is I've been consistent. I think states should decide the issue of marriage and states should decide the issue of abortion. I think we should have a law at the federal level that would say after 15 weeks, no abortion on demand. You have states have the ability to do it at the state level, and we have the ability in Washington to speak on this issue if we choose. I have chosen to speak. Uh, Matt. <laughs> it's pretty clear uh, that, yeah, not much more you could say of than, than what, you know. I've chosen yeah, to speak. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, yeah, so I, I guess, guess yeah. Semi-self-aware there. <laughs> I, uh, what, you know, I think what, when you talk about Cornyn and with, and with McConnell, you know, they were very, I think, smart in giving a roadmap for folks like Herschel Walker or even Tiffany Smiley, if they choose to follow it, of how to talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if I were advising a Senate candidate, I would see what McConnell and Corrin said and let them let essentially... But Herschel Walker did not... Yeah, but Herschel Walker didn't take his if, lead. If, if you believe in something different, then 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 do that. But if, yeah. if there's any uncertainty, follow their lead. Mm. Well, this is apparently a homage to crash test companies. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Mariana, Maria, Matt, M M M. Does anybody get my crash test dummies joke? Anyway. I got it. <laughs> you're you're, you're up my era. Yeah. 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 We just We're in eras now. Thank We're you. in eras. Canada's own crash test dummies. All right, we've got even more midterm analysis on the latest episode of the Chuck Todd Cast. My guest is Nate Cohn of the New York Times. We break down polling only way polling geeks like us can do it. Get it wherever you get your podcasts. Up next, President Zelensky makes a surprise visit to parts of eastern Ukraine that were in Russian hands just days ago. And they've now been retaken by the Ukrainian army. We're live in Kiev next. Welcome back. Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky made a surprise visit to some recent liberated towns, including Izium, today, surveying the damage caused by the war. Zelensky met with soldiers, thanking them for their efforts in retaking Russian-occupied territory. Standing alongside Ukrainian forces, Zelensky watched as a flag was raised symbolically in front of the burned-out City Hall building. Ukraine's surprise offensive has pushed Russian troops out of portions of the northeast and southern Ukraine. 
President Zelensky says his forces have now recaptured more than 1,500 square miles. The Institute for the Study of War, which is a D.C.-based think tank, assesses that the Ukraine uh, recent success may be impacting Russian morale and their ability to use their volunteer forces. Certainly the stories that residents in these recently occupied towns that they're telling about Russian soldiers are quite, uh, quite gripping. I'm joined now by our own Megan Fitzgerald from uh, who's in Kiev for us. And Megan, you know, the stories of of the Ukrainians telling us how the what the occupation was like and then the fleeing of the Russian soldiers. Boy, I mean, it almost some of these stories almost sound too good to be true as if we're just days away from the Russians surrendering. Um, how good do the Ukrainians feel? They are energized. They, uh, it's a morale boost. You know, I mean, what we're seeing right now is uh, one of the biggest victories that they've seen since the beginning of this war, when the Ukrainians were able to push the Russians outside of the outskirts of Kyiv. Uh, and so, you know, this is massive, not only for morale for the country, but for the men and women on the front line. And so it was a significant day seeing President Zelensky in a rare appearance going outside of Kyiv uh, into some of these areas that have recently been liberated. Um, it made a statement. But as you mentioned, Chuck, going back to, uh, you know, now that we're getting a, a scope of what it was like under uh, Russian-occupied territory, it's, it's certainly devastating. I had an opportunity to speak with a member of parliament here in Ukraine uh, who says she fears that the war crimes in the Kharkiv region, in the, in the northeastern part of the country, um, is going to be even worse than what we saw in Bucha. Now, keep in mind, Bucha, we saw that there were reports of women being raped, um, people being assassinated, tortured. We know that right now there's evidence uh, that in a basement of a police station, it was treated as a torture chamber for civilians. Um, so this is very devastating reports. But nevertheless, this counteroffensive rages on. The number of, of land mass that they've been able to take back over the last two weeks continues to rise. The new number coming in today now is 3,200 square miles uh, in just two weeks' time. The Ukrainians are in this to win it, and they believe they can. I want you to listen to what this member of parliament told me not long ago. Mm -hmm. This is a turning point and no return point because Russian army is demotivated. This is point number one. Point number two, Russian people are starting finally asking questions. Chuck, as you know, a big difference between the Ukrainian soldiers and the Russian soldiers. Russian soldiers not really understanding the mission, don't really know what they're fighting for. Yeah. Ukrainians are motivated. They are fighting for their freedom, their independence, their identity. Uh, they can't win this war. I talked to uh, another Ukrainian uh, retired lieutenant colonel earlier today, and he said there's no other choice. They, they have to win this war, Chuck. Megan Fitzgerald on the ground force in Kiev. Megan, with some terrific reporting, thank you. I tell you, when you hear that those Russian soldiers don't even, they don't even know how to communicate why they were occupying Ukraine, I think tells you that the Russians, boy, they have botched this on so, uh, on so many levels. Uh, Megan, thank you. Coming up, yet another migrant surge pushes communities and border patrol to the brink in parts of Texas. We have some new reporting on that situation next. You're watching Beat the Press now. The border is secure, but we also have a broken immigration system, in particular over the last four years before we came in, and it needs to be fixed. Welcome back. That was Vice President Harris during our Meet the Press uh, sit-down on Sunday, where she maintained that our southern border is secure despite the ongoing problems. That said, lawmakers in El Paso, Texas, may not share her feelings. Migrant crossings surged at that South Texas border this week. An average of 1,300 migrants a day are crossing over the southern border into Texas. It's overwhelming Border Patrol. It's now stretching El Paso's temporary migrant processing center to their capacity. And since last Monday, nearly 1,000 migrants have been released from those centers until their removal court dates. Julia Ainsley now joins me with the latest on this story. So, Julia... I think there have been reports that the Democratic mayor of El Paso is now sending migrants on a bus. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So now what's we're going seeing... on here? How overwhelmed are these Texas officials? Well, they're overwhelmed. They're at double capacity inside what they would normally do in their processing center. Now, I was in El Paso when they were at their high just at the end of May. I was able to freely walk around that processing center. They weren't over capacity. Now I'm understanding double the capacity and even the shelters, the mm -hmm. nonprofits, a lot of Catholic charities down there, they're at capacity. So now they've had to release 932 migrants. These are single adults. They're not releasing children onto the street. 
basically hoping that Who are they, they releasing? Will... How do they vet to decide who gets released? Well, they do a biometric screening, and so they decide if anyone is supposed to be a, a threat to public safety, then mm -hmm. they would keep them, they would sure. detain them. So they've said they don't think these people are a threat. They're single adults. They're majority Venezuelan men. Uh, there's been a So big the right push. would call this catch and release, right? That's the phrase that's used. It's even beyond catch and release. Catch mm -hmm. and release is often used when you release someone with a court date. These people aren't even being sent to a place where they'll appear in court. They basically have to find they're just getting their in. own way. A lot of times they'll, they'll have a date where they're supposed to go to an ICE office in the future to get a court date. So are the reason it's mostly Venezuelans is because they have a little more protective status? They do. I mean, obviously there's a big socioeconomic political mm -hmm. crisis in Venezuela. Same thing's happening in Haiti. We're seeing more of these countries who aren't necessarily Central America because that Title 42 COVID order doesn't mm -hmm. apply to them because their countries simply won't take them back. So it's going to take some kind of diplomatic resolution from the Biden administration if they want to ever be able to deport these people. Otherwise, court date doesn't really matter if you can't deport them. All right. What's the definition of a border being secure, right? That's going to be everybody. She tells me the border's secure. And I, 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 I guess reasonable people could say the border's secure and overwhelmed. I don't know. Like, and how? I guess it depends on how do you define secure. Let's just go to the way this administration defined it when they first came into office, and that was mm -hmm. to have a safe, orderly, and humane immigration process. That would not mean what they're seeing in El Paso, where they have 600 migrants waiting for Border Patrol to come up, process them, and they basically release them on the street. Doesn't seem safe, orderly, or humane. That's a fair point, and we're now breaking breaking more records. Still, is there any sense that this surge is going to abate? It went down about 12% over the summer, but oftentimes in these cooler months, it starts to surge again. And if they do lift Title 42, which could happen in October yeah. because of a court order, the Biden administration is going to be really wrangling with this issue right before midterms. Energy crisis, surge at the border, a lot of, lot of, lot of potholes. Democrats may be enthusiastic. A lot of potholes, though, still exist between right. now and November. Julie Ainsley, some good reporting there. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, up next, some newly released text messages from NFL Hall of Famer Brett Favre revealed details about a multi-million dollar Mississippi welfare fraud scandal. The reporter who broke the story joins me next. Welcome back. Let's turn to some new developments in this Mississippi welfare spending scandal. This has actually been a story that's been percolating really for months now. But it's some new developments. We got new text messages that were filed in court documents this week, and they were reported out by our friends at Mississippi Today. And they reveal that the former Mississippi governor, Phil Bryant, pushed to get NFL star Brett Favre state funds set aside for welfare recipients in order to build a volleyball stadium at the alma mater of Favre and Bryant's of the University of Southern Mississippi. Earlier this month, NBC News reported that Favre had received over a million dollars that were diverted from uh, an account that was supposed to be focused on welfare money since 2017 to make speeches that he never actually delivered. Favre has paid back that money, or at least most of it, not the interest on it, but the, but the, the principal amount of money. But now text between Favre and a nonprofit founder named Nancy New, who is facing charges herself related to millions of dollars of welfare fraud, show that he received help from the governor to request some of that money. In one text to New, this is what Favre wrote, quote, he had said to me just a second ago that he had seen it, but hint, hint, that you need to reword it to get it accepted. New replied, reword? Wonder what he means. I am making a call now to get a little more information from someone on the inside, and we'll get back with you. And then in a text to New from 2019, Bryant admitted to helping Favre directly. Quote, just left Brett Favre. Can we help him with his project? We should meet soon to see how I can make sure we keep your projects on course. Favre had previously denied that he knew about the use of welfare funds for this project. But these texts reveal he was worried about how the funding would look. He then texted New the following. If you were to pay me, is there any way the media can find out where it came from and how much? New responded, no. We never had that information publicized. At least until now. <laughs> Joined now by Anna Wolf, a reporter at Mississippi Today. So, Anna, I, this feels as if in some ways, Brett Favre, while being at the center, is the shiny metal object on a scandal that is much more nefarious inside a Mississippi government. And it begins with the use of money that was supposed to be for welfare recipients. Walk me through what this money was supposed to do. 
Sure. So this is money from a fund called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which most people know as the welfare check. This is cash assistance to very poor families in Mississippi. Um, and, you know, the scandal has been unfolding for uh, over two years and all along the way, um, you know, when we're uncovering how $77 million was either stolen or misspent, um, the major players in the scheme, namely former Governor Phil Bryant and Brett Favre, have sort of tried to make excuses for their involvement. Um, as you said, Brett Favre says he doesn't know that it was welfare money uh, that he was using for this project. But, you know, the more that we've gotten information that's come out, the more we've been able to piece together that this was an orchestrated scheme to take money from a federal fund that's supposed to serve the poorest residents in the poorest state yeah. in the country and use it for whatever they wanted. And correct me if I'm wrong, this was a time when there were there were more families applying for, for welfare funds and the state was denying these folks claiming they didn't have the funds for it? They were making it very hard for families to be eligible for this money. So it was a it was an orchestrated attempt to push money away from families by saying you don't qualify for it. You either make too much money or your family situation is mm -hmm. not um, is not eligible for this. Um, and by my last count in Mississippi, a state of three million people with the highest poverty rate in the nation, just 200, about 200 adults receive welfare in Mississippi. This is a federal account. This was why the FBI is involved. I assume justice is involved at this point, right? We understand that I think Favre has now has met with the FBI. Um, is it the former governor that has the most on the line here, Phil Bryant? I mean, it, it, if this is a misuse of federal funds, we're, we're not talking a fine and a slap on the wrist. We're talking jail time. Right. And we do know that the FBI has been investigating this scandal for the last two years. Um, we do know that the Biden administration just appointed a new U.S. attorney for this area, and he will inherit this, the, inherit this welfare investigation. Um, and so I think the text messages are significant. They show kind of the mindset of the people involved, mm -hmm. and they get closer to um, demonstrating how these players really knew what they were doing. Um, they knew how to tweak the regulations right. and tweak their proposals so that they could use this money in this way that was clearly not how it was intended to be used. Uh, the current governor got himself entangled in this story because he seemed to dismiss, a, was it a, a, one of the investigators here? Walk me through that. Right. So the Department of Human Services, this is the agency where the money came from, mm -hmm. uh, filed a civil suit to try to recoup the money back from several people and, and organizations that received this money. I mean, we're talking about $77 million, not, you know, a million to Brett Favre. Um, and uh, in that civil suit, uh, the attorney who was hired wanted to include the volleyball stadium in the suit and wanted to include mm -hmm. the University of Southern Mississippi, uh, but the current governor's office did not let him include the volleyball uh, scheme as part of his complaint, made him take it out. And then over the summer, when he tried to subpoena the Athletic Foundation for communication that would have gotten to the bottom of who was responsible for mm -hmm. this scheme to use welfare money in this way, he was abruptly removed from the case. I mean, it, it, it obviously, it screams cover up. What are they covering up? And I guess that's that's a question we're all trying to get to the bottom of. Yeah, I mean, these text messages show just how involved the former governor and Brett Favre were in this scheme. And what's important about this particular scheme is that it has already resulted in a criminal conviction for someone else in this case. Mm -hmm. So um, the nonprofit owner that you were talking about, her son actually pleaded guilty to defrauding the government. Mm -hmm. You know, this is serious felony, serious prison time uh, for, you know, when he yeah. converted this welfare money to, to, to the volleyball stadium, you know, using a it, trickery, really, right. because they were saying that the volleyball stadium was going to be used by the nonprofit to serve people in poverty, which most people looking at that proposal could tell, yeah. you know, is it, pretty thin. It's kind of a stretch. Let me ask you this. If this happened in Washington, there'd be a congressional committee wanting to investigate. Anything in the Mississippi legislature, has this awoken them at all? That's a really good question. The Mississippi legislature, I don't think, has held a single committee wow. hearing. Um, they hadn't really passed any legislation to address this issue or to, you know, compel the Department of Human Services to use this money in better ways to help uh, impoverished families. Um, it's really kind of gone uh, unnoticed by, you know, yeah. our 
our state leaders. Well, I have to tell you, I think a lot of Mississippi wouldn't know about this at all if it wasn't for Mississippi Today. Uh, I, I'm a subscriber. I hope, folks, if you don't know about it, go look at Mississippi Today. This is an uh, independent news organization um, doing some stuff that isn't being done by enough news organizations down there. Anna Wolf, really appreciate your reporting and the work of Thanks Mississippi so Today. And thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. And before we go, a good luck to Meet the Press's own Carrie Budoff Brown and Bridget Bowman of the political unit. They're both playing in tonight's annual Congressional Women's Softball game. It's for charity. So if you're in the D.C. area, get your tickets. It's a beautiful night. Get out there. Come watch a pretty good game. And if you're not, go online and make a donation. The game is raising money for the Young Survival Coalition. It's an organization for young women fighting breast cancer. Do it now. Go do it now. And if you're around town, please check out this game. NBC News Now coverage will continue with my colleague, Yasmin Wasugian, who's in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.